got to tell you, I'm excited about getting into the book of Revelation next week. We start off and, uh, <laughs> and uh, we start uh, our, our journey through an awesome book. So uh, just don't expect to go in such a great hurry to start with, okay? We, we're going we're gonna to dig down deep and then uh, uh, just follow through. And uh, uh, it's kind of like I, I, I'm... I'm bragging a little bit here, but in our recent trip to Israel, we went through Hezekiah's tunnel and uh, had to go down and down and down and down and down, and then you got to the tunnel and then you sloshed through the air and the water and all, but it was way down, you know. It's, it, it really is magnificent the way that God uh, gave them the wisdom to do that. Uh, and that's it. When we go to the Revelation, when we're not looking for new stuff, but we want to be down deep enough to be able to get everything out of it that, that God has for us. So, so that's kind of interesting and, and exciting. But listen, this morning I just want to share with you, um, it's a tradition for Calvary chapels to do a, what we call a prophecy update. I'm not going to do it because I, I, I don't, you know, the tradition and, and, and I'm rebellious. And no, I'm not. <laughs> but, uh, but I just want to share with you something that I believe will be an encouragement for you uh, through the year. And, um, uh, I want to start off with some negative and then finish off with, with uh, uh, the only true positives that there are, and that's through the Word of God. So um, bear with me, because uh, we've left 2011 now, and we have entered into 2012. And you know what, for a lot of people there's a lot of apprehension, there's a lot of wonder at what lies ahead uh, following a tumultuous year that we've had. It's been... It's been really, really hair-raising in, in many areas of the world. We, we saw this very country start with violence and tragedy, uh, you know, with the floods in Queensland and all, and, and it seems like it's finished the same way with lots of violence going on. And, and, uh, and we look around the world and we see chaos and uh, the place just seems to be in a mess. Um, nations are being attacked from even within their own countries, from angry mobs demanding their own way. And, uh, it, it just seems like, you know, that the violence and the instability is just rife across the nation and uh, it just seems like, where's it all end and what, what's it coming to? And the volatility of, of the Middle East continues on unabated. In fact, it, it increases as we look and see the, the, the Iran and what's going on there and, and Iraq, uh, you know, uh, what's happening there. It, and uh, it just seems like the world is riddled with wars and rumours of war. And you, you can't listen to the news, you can't pick up the paper without uh, reading about that kind of stuff. And, and even in the church, you know, you, you, you look at what's going on in the church at large, you know, and it seems that the church has lost its stability for sound doctrine uh, as it, as it wishy-washes all over, well, that's a good word, eh? wishy-washes all over the place, you know, with, with, with just, just following all sorts of stuff. And, um, and it also seems on that basis that genuine Christianity has been attacked on, on all levels, you know, uh, just for, for the fact of, of, of our fundamental belief in the Word of God. And, and it seems a lot, like a lot of the attack has come from within the church. And, and so, you know, you, you think, well, where, where is it all going? And you and I, as, as born-again, Bible-believing Christians, are more and more we're, we're, we're marginalised and we're treated as bigots, you know, and, and uh, uh, just being intolerant because we stand upon the Word of God. And, and, and increasingly around the world, Christians have been slaughtered for their faith. And, uh, and there's not, there are not many countries left where Christians are uh, abused and, and treated with such disdain. Um, most of it, of course, is in the name of Allah, and, and we know that, and, and it just goes on and on and on. And so, you know, the world is, the world is messy as we enter into 2012. And, and, uh, and I'm not a believer in the Mayan calendar that says this is the last year and we're all going to be destroyed. I'm just telling you the facts of what we see out there in, in the world. And, and, be, and on the other side of the coin too is the weather and the way that it's going. It's just, it's just it's changing dramatically. And, you know, the increasingly violent effects of, of the weather are, 
uh, blamed on El Nino and Elvis and Adelaide and somebody, you know, all this sort of stuff. But the weather is just going haywire, and, and uh, we've seen floods and fires. Our own nation this past year has experienced floods and fire and, and, and all these things, just tragedy. And everybody scratches their heads and what is happening? Where is it leading? Where will we finish up? And of course you look across, you know, I, I, every night I, I just see how the, the corporate world is going and, and you know what, it, it, greed and corruption are driving everything. Uh, in, in, in all aspects of economy and all, you know, and it just seems like the corporate men and women are clamouring for the superiority and for the riches and, and, and why we tie to anybody that gets in the way and, and so we just see that taking place and, and uh, so, you know, it, it, it's just all happening. Isn't that negative? <laughs> but I'm going to finish on a positive. But you know what, the, you know, everywhere, you know, the world, the weather, the financial stuff, you know, it, you and I know now we read the papers, of course it all relates back to it's Israel's fault. Now everything in the world that's happening see, appears to be Israel's fault. But um, I was just, just, I, I just uh, got a few down here, you know. Uh, um, in fact, I was just reading this morning that uh, another, just a, a prophetic uh, a speculation. Uh, uh, although the, the signs appear to be that way, that Iran and Israel will be at war within the, uh, by the end of January or February, I think it is, and, and uh, there's going to be a, a nuclear aspect to that war. Uh, we're watching suicide bombers continue to cause horrific carnage and as innocent lives die, and then we listen to uh, the powers that be say that uh, they're... they're the journey into Iraq to release the people from oppression has been a great success and yet, you know, bombs are exploding, suicide bombers and people are dying. Countries, uh, many countries are becoming more and more under the, the control or the influence of Sharia law. And, um, and then the law, you, you look across at Europe and Europe is an absolute trash mess, you know, financially and politically and, and, and Russia, of course, was Mr. Putin. Uh, manipulating all the scenarios so they can maintain control and take it back under the old Soviet Union that we knew, the Cold War days and all, all these things and then there's riots now in, in Russia and of course uh, um, there's, there's North Korea with a change of leadership but who knows what's going to happen there um, you know, and look, other countries, uh, you know, it's just man, it's, you think, oh my god, I said to Rowan when I got back from Israel, I, you know what, I, I can't wait to go back to Israel again. And then you look at what's going on, you think, oh, I don't know whether I really want that. You know? yeah, but uh, yeah, just because of the mess that's going on. Uh, I was reading about Mexico uh, the other day. Uh, uh, that's another country that's imploding. They say that more Mexicans have died since 2007 than all the American soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan since 2001. All over drugs. All over that industry, yeah, you know, the, the barbarism, the anarchy that's going on in that country or because of this, this, um, this, this industry that's going on over there. And, and so, you know, we look at them and we go, whoa, woo, balloons and all that sort of stuff. We enter into 2012. But take a look at the world. Take a look at the condition of the place. It's a mess. You get my drift. It's, you know, in, in the natural, it's not very exciting. You know, what have we got to look forward to in the country? And there's a lot of uncertainty. You know, the clock is ticking closer and closer to the midnight hour. And, um, but as it does, I want to, I want to leave you with a, with a thought this morning that there, uh, amongst all the uncertainty, there is something that is an absolute certainty. It's rock solid. It doesn't change. And as we enter into 2012 as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what we look to. That's what we cling to. And it's found in the sun. And I, you know, I just, you know, whoa, I got all that out. got it all off my chest. Now I want to just take you through a psalm. It's just a glorious, glorious um, chapter of confidence for us. It's talking about the sovereignty of God. Psalm 33. Psalm 33. I want to share this with you as we enter the new year. And 
hopefully it, it gives us a clear and a proper perspective on the wholesome area that I just painted for you of what it's like out there. But I want, you know, uh, I want us to see the reality as a believer, as a Christian. I want us to get excited about the coming 12 months. The, the, should the Lord tell it. Um, and, and just allow, allow our hearts to be opened up to, to the reality of this God that we serve. And I've got to be honest with you, uh, as we go through this psalm, it's intended to ignite in us some praise and, and some adoration and some, and some worship and some confidence in Almighty God, Sovereign God. And, uh, and I pray that that's what it does in you. When, when we finish this morning, uh, that we'll just go, yeah, we can look forward to what's going to happen because of our God, because of what, what He is doing, because of who He is, and, and, uh, and, and just get really excited about it. So Psalm 33, and I just want to, uh, let's just start at verse 1 and allow God to, to speak to our hearts. Now don't worry about the fellow, he might even be able to hear something, and that'll be great. So it says, Rejoice in the Lord! <laughs> oh, you righteous, that's us. <laughs> For praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. That means a fresh song, a fresh new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. The word shout there it literally means to jump for joy. Uh, play skillfully with a, with a shout of joy. I don't do that because I'm struggling to just even play the chords on a guitar. But you, you get the drift. We can be so excited. For the word of the Lord is right. And all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Notice first who he addresses this to. He addresses it to the righteous, the upright. It's not addressed to, to somebody who doesn't follow him or believe in him. It's addressed to us. And then he says, to you who are righteous and upright, this is what I'm saying. So we receive it this morning because a, a Christian is the only one who can fully grasp what the psalmist is saying here in this chapter. And, and the invitation is to praise the Lord. The invitation is to worship God. He gives us reasons for that in these first uh, few verses there. He says, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. See, when you, you say, well, why do we put up with uh, uh, this Tim Pot guitarist? Why do we put up with, uh, why do we stand there for 20 minutes and sing songs and, and, and praise songs and worship songs? Because the psalmist says, because to, to the Lord, it is beautiful. <laughs> to worship and praise God is beautiful. The, the Hebrew word is nave. You think I'm pretty cluey, huh? I looked it up. It's nave. And it means it is becoming. It is very becoming of us as righteous and upright to sing praise to God, to worship God. It's, another word can be used as appropriate. It's appropriate that you and I should be able to worship God and have an attitude of, of praise before the Lord. Going back further in the, in the Hebrew language, the, the root word for that is, is to be at home and to dwell. In other words, he's saying uh, uh, praise from the upright, it, it ought to be just, well, it dwells within us. It's there. We don't have to come and have a six-piece band to try and generate something for us to praise and worship God. We can do it without that. You say, well, maybe we could. <laughs> Thanks. No, I ain't kidding. But but you understand? You know, it, it, it's just letting that praise and worship just just it's here, and and it doesn't take great things to prompt us to go. Lord, I love you. Lord, you're awesome. Lord, you're powerful. Oh God, I sing to you out of my heart because of your goodness to me. It should be just there. It should be just dwelling in our hearts. That's what it means to be at home. In other words, an attitude that we have. He says, you know, rejoice in the Lord, you righteous. Uh, 
Sing praise, you won't, right? Because it's awesome and it ought to be in your heart. It ought to be there. Just, just that, that, that beautiful sense of, of praise. Let me just read you one verse. You don't have to turn there, but let me just read it to you. Um, in, in Psalm 22, you, you'll, uh, you, I think some of you may know this verse well. It says, But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of your people. Get it? He's enthroned in the praises of his people. It literally means that we, we form a throne when we praise God and he comes and dwells amongst us. Dwells in that praise. How beautiful is that? And I want to tell you, the Jewish people knew and still do know how to sing. We went to a, uh, a church on, uh, on, on Shabbat in, in Jerusalem and and they just were real. And they sung all the, some of the courses, or one or two on you, I think. I can't remember. But they, they sing it with that, that you know, that, that, that kind of Jewish, woohoo, you know. And, 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 no, great, right. You like that? Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and, and it's, just, it's just so awesome. They really know how to lift their voices and, and sing before the Lord. And, and, and so the, the writer here is saying, you know, rejoice in the Lord. And he goes on, he says, you know, sing to him a fresh song. That's, that's what it ought to be for us. We can do that. Fresh. Uh, in, in the, that word new uh, means, you know, they're literally fresh or a renewed song. And I'm, I'm starting to realize the Lord is kind of uh, dealing with me that... that um, uh, we need to be at a process here of growth in our worship that we that we we're getting where we God's leading us to new songs to sing to Him and you know we're not uh, I haven't got the skill to write a word here and there and put you know stuff down it's enough to just play C G and D even for those of you who know guitar but but you know what we ought to be able to move forward and so uh, I think the Lord's dealing with us that, that this coming year there are going to be some new choruses or songs the Lord's going to lead us into in, in our worship before Him. But, you know, a fresh new song. Uh, and this, this fresh song happens because God is almighty and we recognize that, that there's this glorious intervention in our day-to-day -day walk. And it's the intervention of an almighty God, sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing. And he comes in every in every aspect of our life and there's nothing that catches him off guard any day of the week that you wherever you may be. You know? When your car breaks down, God knows about it. When you get a flat tire, God knows about it. You know? When you, when something else goes wrong in the house, God knows about it. We still can give him praise because, oh Lord, this has just gone wrong. But you know all about it. Whew, I'm glad of that. Because you're my man. And you'll make all things right. And so, you know, a, a, a situation that may be hopeless, a situation or a circumstance that may be just almost devastating to us, we give praise because uh, He is there. We can give a fresh new song to God because He knows all about it. He knows where we are, where we are at, that, at that moment. He knows what the year has in store for us this coming year. He knows what he's got in store for you tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. He knows it all. He knows where you will be. He knows what choices you will make, whether they are good or bad, whether they are beneficial or not beneficial. He knows. He'll do whatever he can in our lives to, to uh, get us to make all those good decisions. And, uh, but you know what? It's, it's just from that impulse of knowing that God is intervening in my life enables me to have the ability to sing praises to Him and to glorify His name and to just lift up my voice. How good that is. Turn with me, would you, to, to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42. Let me just read a couple of verses there with you. Isaiah 42, I'll start reading, okay? Verse 6. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will hold your hand. 
I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to anyone else, nor my praise to any carved images. Behold, the former things have come to pass and new things I declare. Before they spring forth, I will tell you of them. Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you, you coastlands and you inhabitants of them. You know, what, a, what an awesome thing talking about uh, uh, the coming of the Messiah. You know, you know uh, um, you are going to set the captives free. Let's sing a song because we've been set free. God is talking to his servant, Christ, coming and what he's going to accomplish. And so he says, sing to the Lord. Do you know, that I think there's 180 something, something 180 plus in, in uh, places in the world where we're encouraged to sing. Israel is always encouraged to sing. You know, when they marched around the walls of Jericho, what was the first thing they had to do? Get those fellows out the front and start praising God, singing to the Lord. So the application of that part is, uh, for you and I, let's look at what the Lord has done this past year. Let's look at the way the Lord has seen us through some trauma and some, and some hardships. Let's, but let's look at what He's done and, and then let's think of what He will do for us over this coming year and, and what he will do through us this coming year. And you know what? That alone ought to prompt a praise response from us. Oh God, you're so faithful. Lord, you are so good. I wonder this morning if you do really appreciate the good things that God has done for you and what he's done in you and through you. You don't know the lies that you touch. You, you know, it's just it's amazing. How God just begins to move. And I'm just, Richard was just sharing with me this morning about the opportunity at work to share Christ with a couple who, or with one guy who classifies himself as an atheist. And, and you know what? The guy's just been going doing maintenance work day after day after day. And you think, oh man, you know. You know and, and then all of a sudden, bang, God says, now is the time. You know, you can praise for that. Yeah, buddy. You worship the Lord for that. Because that is an open door that God has given you. And he's, he's considered that you are worthy to do it. You know? Oh, yes, yeah, it's so good. You know, and so we ought to appreciate the good things that God is doing in us and through us. Um, and when you do, you know, you don't have any difficulty in praising God. You know, it just comes. It's, it's the praise that dwells in our hearts, as we heard earlier. It's there. It's at home. Uh, even as it says in, in verse 3 back in our text, you know, uh, when we sing that fresh new song, you know, we, uh, with a shout or a jump of joy. Wow, God, you let me be involved in the working of your kingdom. Wow, what a privilege that is until we jump for joy. Go home and read Psalm 96. What an awesome chapter that is also about rejoicing before God and singing praise to him. And... Uh, uh, listen, if you're that close in Isaiah, uh, just have a look at Isaiah 26. And I'll just, just the first few verses there. Listen to what it says. I'll start reading. It's, it's chapter 26. It shouldn't take long to get back there. It's talking about Israel's return. And this is what it says. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever for in Yah the Lord is everlasting strength. It's a song we sing. It's a song we can let rip from our hearts to God. You know, I know that we know the verses, you know, Lord, you'll keep me in perfect peace because as, as my mind is stayed upon you, but, you know, sing it. Oh, Lord, you know, you're going to keep me in peace and my mind is stayed upon you. Hallelujah. Oh, you know what I mean. You've seen this stuff. You can let rip in your hearts the goodness of God. 
That's why we shout for joy in our text. Or jump for joy. You notice another reason he's given you for doing just that? We will finish the chapter, don't panic. Okay? It's just, because it's just so much here. Verse 4 says, uh, we, we do all those things and we shout and we praise. Listen, for the word of the Lord is right. And all his work is done in truth. That's why we shout for joy. That's why we jump for joy. Because it says there, the word of the Lord is right and his work is done in truth. And you and I can be guaranteed this morning that the word of God, every, every dot of the I and every cross of the T will come to pass. He promised it. And all those prophecies back in the Old Testament, hundreds of years before Christ ever came, were fulfilled. And, and that's what uh, those of us, when we get back into midweek studies in Daniel, you'll see that to the day, to the literal day after hundreds of years, the, the fulfillment of prophecy, the, the word of God is faithful and true. It will come to pass. There is so much evidence for that. And so his word is absolutely righteous and true and unchanging and, and trustworthy. Uh, you know what the literal word that means? That means it's convenient. Isn't it convenient in a moment when you need to hear from God? Then you open up his written word that he's given us a, as a resource and, and all of a sudden God just speaks to you. And you go, I'm glad that was in there. It's convenient. It's convenient for you. And another time, you know, when, when, when things are going tough and you, you may be down in the dumps and your bottom lip's just dragging a bit across the gravel, you know, and it's just, it's really, it's a hard time. And all of a sudden you open the Bible and you read and all of a sudden this pleasant word, you know, I, I know the thoughts I have towards you. The thoughts of peace. And, and you start to go, oh, and you, and you, you know, that the lip starts to come back up into its place again. And, oh, and it's pleasant. And it's awesome for us. And of course, you know what? And don't you listen as well. It all is it's also the other word that can be used for it is prosperous. Oh, then we don't get the Mercedes and the Cadillac and the No, no, no. <laughs> Bless God. No, no, stop that. And you know what it, it just means it's prosperous to our soul and our spirit. Yes. It matures us, it grows us, it stabilizes us. It's powerful. It's just, you know, and so it's, it, it's just got those, those characteristics to it. It is it's absolutely pleasant to us, his, uh, his word. That's what it means by being right. And of course, you know, all his works, it says, are done in truth. And, and they equally, it can say from the Hebrew perspective and the language there, it's, it's faithful. And the, the word literally means there, fidelity. It means it's true and faithful. It's reliable and it's dependable. We're talking about the Bible. This is, you know, the Bible that everybody goes, oh, the Bible. Yeah, yeah, it's God's word. He's spoken to us. Yes. The um, Life Application Study Bible says this, trustworthy. The Bible is reliable because unlike people, God does not lie. God does not forget. God does not change his words. And God does not leave his promises unfulfilled. Amen. Well, shut my mouth. We just said it all. But let's do what James Montgomery Boyce says. This, this kind of brings it back home. Uh, you know, where I've got to go, oh, yeah, Lord, I've got to be careful. Because he says this. You know, on the basis of, of the, the word of the Lord being right and his work being faithful, the, Montgomery Boyce says this, how different it is with us. We say one thing and we do another. So that we are inconsistent at best and hypocritical or blatantly dishonest at worst. Because we don't keep our word. But not so with God. God is faithful and uh, true and, and, and righteous. His word is spot on. He loves righteousness, it says in verse 5. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. It goes without saying. It goes without saying that he loves righteousness and justice. And that's why we know that he will deal with this world and this earth. And he will deal with nations. But that wasn't me. 
and we will deal, and he will deal with it justly and rightly. And so we learn to rely completely on the Lord by recognizing the power of his word. When we understand the reality that this word is powerful, it's authoritative, it's true, it will be fulfilled, it has been fulfilled in many parts, and there's, there's a few bits left before we go home to be with him, it will happen, it will take place, we can put our trust in him. On that basis, let's jump for joy. Let's sing praises to God. He, gets, he goes on uh, over his, quite a, most of the rest of the chapter there and he just gives some examples of, of the power of the Word of God. And I thought it was appropriate because of um, uh, you know, what I said at the start about the, the, the situation in their world the, 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 you know, um, and nation against nation and also the weather and all. Listen to this. Let's have a look at the, word of his, uh, the power of his Word in creation in verse 6 to 9. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the water of the sea together as a heap, and he lays up the deep in, in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was. And your Bibles might have a little word in italics, done. That's just to help you understand, but in the literal it's just, he spoke, and it was. He commanded and it stood fast. And so, you know, that's the power of God's word in creation. You know, a Christian knows this and recognises this. And, and remember, this chapter is addressed to the righteous and the upright. And so we know that. We recognise. And that, that knowledge of the, the power of his word, even in create, creation, is what uh, forms a solid foundation for us to rest in him. Well, Lord, you know what's happening. Yeah, but the floods were, were massive. And, but Lord, you know what's happening. You know what's happening. That's enough for me that you know what's happening. You know, the old earth is creaking and groaning. And, and, but, but the Creator knows. Because it was a word, or the power of his word, that brought it into being. I was reading these things just the other day too. Astronomers are discovering vast regions of space. I, I, I read one on, on one of my email subscriptions just a few weeks back, and I read this. And um, there are vast regions of space that are totally, absolutely empty. Empty. One such space they found is they estimate a billion light years across. And I'll, that um, that is ten thousand times greater than the distance across our Milky Way galaxy. It's just blank. There's nothing there. And I reckon there are billions of huge galaxies like our Milky Way. And so you know what? It's just, it, it just boggles you. God put it all into place. And, uh, he, and he knows it all. I'm just quickly turning. I'm sorry, I'll read this to you and I'll tell you. Um, o Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. Oh God, how great you are. And so the power of his word in creation and neighbours, you and I say, well, the weather, you know, whatever's going on, God knows what's happening. And if our house happens to get flooded, God knows that too. And God will always meet the needs of his people. And he does. In verse, in verse 7 it says, He gathers the water of the sea together as a heap. And he lays up the deep in storehouses. You know, it's kind of reminded me of when he, when he had the children crossing over uh, the Jordan and they backed the water up into a heap of walls, you know, and said, right, I cross over there now. And, you know, whew. you know, looking at that water. Whoa, dude, look at that, you know. And just walking across. Greatness of our God. The world's oceans cover two-thirds of the Earth's surface. The Pacific Ocean covers alone almost 
Uh, I'm not talking old style because that's what I, I kind of grab. Okay, 64 million square miles at an average depth of over 14,000 feet. Greatest depth of the Pacific is 36,000 feet. But it says here, he gathers the waters together as a heap. He lays up the deep storehouses. In other words, there's not an inch that he doesn't know what's going on. Wow. God, you're so awesome. And so the psalmist pictures God as just piling up the, the water together, you know, like, just like the old farmer, you know, gets his grain and piles that we saw that up near Pindley the other day. They just pile all the grain in a, into a heap and, and, and the psalmist is going, it's just like God has just got all the water going, okay, pile it into the heap and put it there and, and, and such is the power of the Creator and His Word. And so there's that power in the creation. But also, you know, yeah, we can deal with that. And God knows what's going on in the weather. But look at verses 10 through to 19. You know, the power of his word in history. And this is really about the providence of God. I'm, nearly, I'm trying to finish. Hurry, 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 hurry. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect or the contrivances of people of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Of course, it, he's, they're talking about Israel there too. But you know what? It, it, it's relative. We can, we can receive it today. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts. Individually, he considers all their works. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain or hope for safety. That's a great word there. He says that the horse is a vain hope for safety. You know what the word, you know what the word we get? It's a sham. <laughs> Total sham. You know? I think some of the deals that I've looked at and talked with car yard salesmen, you know, total sham. You know, that's what the word means. It's a, he says, the, the horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him and on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. So you know what? It's just talking about the divine providence of God. God raises up and he pulls down. We haven't got time, but Romans chapter 13 tells us that, that God places him in authority and God removes from authority. You and I know that. So you know what? As much as we see people in power that we don't maybe don't want them in power, God places them in power. And you know, uh, that's just the way it is. And pray for them. That's what we're, we're required to do. Just pray for them. But it just lets us know that God's in control. You know what? He wanted the, the, the powers of being in government for this moment for Australia in any other nation because God is doing it. It's very clear that God sets up and he takes down. You know, and even those who appear to be the most powerful and the most in control, they are all in alignment with the sovereign purposes of God. They may not recognise it, but they are. And God is working his purposes. You know, go right back to Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, Artaxerxes, and, and whoever else you want to read about in the Old Testament, they were there because God placed them there for a purpose. We've been seen a bit of that through through the book of Daniel, you know, how God raises up and then pulls down and then raises up and then takes away and then raises up. And he's doing it all. He's in control there. God allows and God causes for the furthering, furthering of his purposes. And, and, and we just got to know that he's it, operating in history. You know, you know, people out there are making decisions that they think solely are based on them, and people go, "Oh, what a mighty!" I was going to say, oh, "What kind of leader?" But you know, what a mighty man or woman you are, and that you make. Yeah, yeah, okay, they're, they're making decisions, but God is working uh, providentially to use those decisions for His agenda. Proverbs 19.21 says, There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Whew. So, 
on that basis, I'll go back to verse 1. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. Jump for joy. Because God's still in control. That's why it is, honestly, it's why it's so, it's vital. It's so important for us here at Calvary Chapel to align with God's plan and purpose and not our own. And not go rushing off on a tangent. Not looking out for the flavour of the month that comes across because somebody's wrote a book. And so we go, oh, let's follow this book. Oh, let's follow that. Oh, let's do this. Oh, let's do that. Uh, and, and the next thing you know, it's just a quagmire and people are lost and struggling and in, in the mud and they're just uh, spiritually speaking and they're just, you know, we will and must align with what God wants for us. And that's what we will do. Otherwise, our plans will be of no effect. It tells us here. So we wait upon the Lord and He will guide us. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Uh, the Lord's plans stand firm forever, says the uh, Life Application Study Bible. But maybe, you know, you're, you're like me, you get frustrated by the inconsistencies that you see in those in leadership, whether, you know, you know politically, so to speak, you know. But you know what? Let's, let's just rest in the fact that God is absolutely trustworthy. And here it tells us the power of his word in history. God knows what he's doing. He's in control. There's nothing outside. His intentions don't change. They are always just and right, as it says. And when you wonder if anyone can be trusted, remember, God is completely consistent. It says here, his counsel stand forever. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. May we not be found guilty of not praying for our nation, this nation of Australia. You know, the old verse said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways and pray. Now I'm going to heal the land. Let's keep praying for the nation of Australia. Let's pray that God will move. Let's pray for an outpouring of His Spirit. And let's allow God to do what He will do. Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to a new people. So we pray for our nation. You know, there's corruption, there's graft, there's the bribery, it seems to be like it's the everyday play for those in authority. But let's keep praying. Let's keep praying. Because the Lord looks from heaven and he sees everything. He's keeping an eye on what goes on. He considers all these works and knows exactly what's taking place. Aren't you glad this morning that we have the watchful eye of God upon us? No matter where you are today, no matter what circumstance you are in this morning, God has got an eye on you. God knows what's taken place. God knows your heart. For those who don't belong to Christ, you know, the, the thought of God watching uh, eye upon them, well, man, it would be terrifying. God's watching Oh, you know, I'm being evil, I'm doing all this stuff, or I'm not walking with Jesus, or I've rejected Jesus, and, and oh, that eye's watching. That's watching. I'm not trying to be silly. It's a, it's a reality. God is watching every eye. It says there. He watches. But for us who are in Christ this morning, I want to tell you, your sins are covered by the blood of Jesus, and the thought of God's watchful eye taking, uh, watching over you every minute of the day is one of the most comforting things you can ever have in your heart. Out of that bubbles up the praise that is dwelling there to enable you to give thanks to the Lord and offer up praise to Him. Uh, the, the contemporary English version says, The Lord gave us each a mind and nothing we do can be hidden from Him. Think about it. Think about it. Whether they're in Vietnam or in Israel or wherever you are during this week, God knows what, you, what is going on in your heart. And uh, he understands not only what we do, but also why we do it. And 16 and 17 says, No king is saved by the multitude of an army. You know, the biggest, the greatest, the best. You know, in this last couple of weeks, we've watched the big parades in North Korea, all the tanks and all those. I don't know how they march like that. I struggled in the army to march, just putting one foot in front of the other. But they dance along, you know, you know goose-stepping along. But you know, you see all these guys going along there, and they're showing their might and their strength and their power, and saying, keep an eye on us, we'll beat you down, you know. And, and then you look at Russia, and they have their, their great big thing going through the, uh, in, in um, where it is, in, in the 
Bremen and they, you know, anyway, you know, and the Red Square, that's what it is. And you know, there are all these big armies and they're just boasting of their, their strength and their power and their might and, and all that, you know, we are the greatest, uh, you know, they're not a match for the sovereignty and power of God. Not none of them together combined are a match. Do you remember, Rebel and I just bought a DVD uh, uh, yesterday, I think it was, and we watched it last night on uh, some of the miraculous things that have taken place in Israel over the last, um, since 1948, because they were attacked the day that they were established as a nation, the enemy came against them. And you know, and just watching, and, and some of the things are totally unexplainable, how God just did what he did, you know. But they were fighting against the, the uh, I think, the Syrians or the Jordanians, and, and you know, the guys, all they could do to get across this great big field at night was uh, in a row of guys just go along with their bayonets and find all the landmines because it's totally mine. And they were doing it and they were talking about it and they couldn't explain it except that it had to be a miracle. That they, they go like this and, and they'd find one and then they just have to, you know, and, and disarm it. And the guy asked me, he said, what happens if you got a little way and the enemy started firing? Yeah, well, we just get run back and hope we don't tread on anything, you know? And it was just like that. But they said all of a sudden, uh, the clouds came and darkened the, the moon and, and then this wind just came and he said, we don't know where it came from or what, it, and it blew and blew and so much so they could hardly see themselves. It was like they were in a total big dust storm and it only lasted for a, for a short space of time and then the clouds disappeared and the moon came and said, he said, the wind, I was listening last night and wow, the wind just dropped like that, dead still. And I looked out across from the moon and there's every landmine uncovered. They got up and they walked through. The, the, you know, the, the miraculous. God is in control. No matter how much an army thinks they are strong to destroy Israel, they will never destroy Israel. Amen. Never. You know, we just we have that, that absolute because God's in control. So, how should we end at 2.12? You say, no, hurry up, Daryl. The roast is getting cold. <laughs> in light of the volatility of the world in which we live, you know, the, the fear and the trepidation, and, you know, the hearts failing because of fear, you know. Not for us, though. You know, for them, out there. Okay, how should we end the 2012? Listen to this. Verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Amen. So, how am I going to enter 2012? With absolute confidence in God that he's going to put some tucker on the table. He's going to pay the power bill, the increased water bill, the increased gas bill, because he just meets my needs. Yes. He's constantly watching over me. I need to trust him. I need to depend upon his mercy every day. I know that he will care for me. Now we haven't got time, but you know, oh, the riches, the depths of the wisdom and knowledge of God. You go to Romans 8 and read the last portion of that chapter there. It's just, oh God, you are just unbelievable. Any, any wonder I can stand before you, gang, and loving this family and loving the word of God and loving uh, the fact that God has dragged me you know, uh, maybe screaming and carrying on out of darkness, but to be here, but to have the assurance that I have today. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart shall rejoice in Him, because we are trusted in His holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us, just as we hope in you. May this coming year and that word wait there, it, it, by the way, is, is an interesting word. Um, it means to adhere to. You know? Um, have you ever used super glue and all of a sudden going, uh-oh, uh-oh, I have. You know, it's quite distressing. You know? Uh, uh, but, uh, or you join something together with a super glue and then you, and you pick your hand away and the whole thing comes with you. you know? <laughs> You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. That's it's, it. says our soul waits for the Lord. It means to adhere to. We, we cling to the Lord. Because he's our help and our shield. 
So when you enter 212, adhere to the Lord, because that's the only place you're going to get help. That's the only place where you know that you've been watched over and cared for to the max. You know that verse in, in um, Isaiah 40, huh? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You know, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. You know, they run and they won't be weary. The word means to be entwined. So I'm, I'm suggesting if you want to have a great year this coming year, you, you allow the Lord to uh, bring you in close and be adhered to Him. And allow His Spirit to entwine you into a relationship with Him. That's the only time that I can give you an absolute guarantee that this year is going to be dynamic for you. Any other way, I can't do that. You know, that's the truth. So we're going to put our total reliance upon the faithfulness of God to be our protector. In spite of, regardless of the condition of the world, regardless of what the weather does, we will rejoice in the Lord. We will trust Him and we will see the salvation of the Lord. Amen. That's what we have to look forward to. I want to finish with this very short little story. It was in Charles Haddon Spurgeon's little um, commentary on, on Psalms, the treasury of David. Now he had credited the story to another guy called Edward Kalami. It's about a young boy who was at sea during a dangerous storm and it was really, really, really dangerous and hairy and the sea, you know, you see those old pictures, you know, you ever seen the, the TV show with the giant crabbing in the world, you know, and, and, and they're Okay, don't worry about it. But it's violent, okay? It's violent, violent ocean. And 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 this the all the passengers were freaking out, you know, that their wits in, we're never gonna get out, you know, and totally disturbed. And they look at this little fellow there and he's he's just whistling away and everything's cool. Hanging on, but everything's cool. Everything's okay. He was cheerful. And they went up to this little fellow and said, how on earth could you be cheerful when we're in the midst of all this danger and it's quite possibly we're going to sink with no way of rescue? And he just said to them, my father is the pilot of the ship. I'll know, I just know he's going to take good care of me. You know what? No one who trusts in our God, God Almighty, will ever be disappointed, will never need to fear, will never need to be apprehensive. No one who waits or, is, or, or has that trust in, in, in God will ever be let down. I've got to tell you, we're in for an exciting year. Yes. An exciting year. God is in control. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, for the confidence that we can have in a mighty God. <coughs> Almighty God. Sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere at all times. Our God. Our Father God. The one that we can cry, Abba. Lord, we commit this coming year to you. Two ways, Lord. We commit this year to you as a church group. We want your guidance. We want you to direct every step that we take. We don't want to be in a place where we try to steer this to do what we want to do, to what we think is, this is what happens, this is the method, this will work, this won't work. But Lord, we just want to be trusting you. Because you are in control and your word is powerful. So Father God, as a church, we just submit ourselves to you this morning. Lord, as individuals, Father, every one of us is taking steps, different steps, different stages, different places, different environments. But Lord God, you know our hearts. You told us then that, that, that uh, you fashion or you mould as a potter our hearts individually and you consider all our works. That Lord, each one of us opens our heart and lays it bare before you this morning. You know us. Lord, would you look upon us and determined to work with us and in us and through us this coming year.
that we might entwine ourselves with you, be adhered to you through Jesus Christ, and so have the full expectancy of a watchful father over the ensuing 12 months. Lord, we thank you that you're in control. It gives us confidence and comfort, enables us to rest in that knowledge. So, thank you so much. Lord, we commit this coming week to you. We pray that you'll guide our steps. You'll be with us in all that we do, wherever we go, whatever takes place. May we never lose sight of the fact that our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. He rules in our hearts. and reigns in our hearts also. And that we can just trust you for all. Continue with us in fellowship here this morning too, Father. Thank you for the time that we've had to study with you your word. We ask it and, and present it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have some fellowship, some coffee, some bickies, I think. And